do have to say, I do have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm not mad at JJ or anything like that. I don't hate him or anything like that. I mean, because basically, he, he has changed Star Trek. He has, let's be honest. Um, but he has brought a whole new slew of people to the franchise, which are the, tw the teens and the tweens who weren't interested in us before, who now, because the new cast is pretty hunky, I mean, you know. <laughs> I mean, Carl Urban, let's... <laughs> What is it with the Urbans, eh? Because Keith Urban is my pass, is my one whole pass, right? <laughs> he is my pass. I haven't told my husband yet, but he is my one whole pass. <laughs> but then the other Urban is really cute too. So um, Keith, the, the Keiths and the Carl Urbans, yeah. But so they brought this, he's brought this whole new audience to Star Trek. And hopefully, as they like the two new movies, they may go back and watch the thing from the beginning. You never know, right? So it's all good, it's all good things. It keeps the franchise alive, um, keeps us all busy, and you know, every time there's a new movie, there's an uptick in interest in Star Trek, and we all earn more money, which is good. <laughs> right? So, I have to say about this convention, I'm very impressed with it, because it's obviously fan run for the fans, and um, everyone, it's like one big family and everyone seems to know each other and have been meeting here for years. And I think that's fantastic that you all have this. Um, and am I right in thinking it's basically a writer's thing for writers? No, because all the prizes were for writing at the opening ceremonies yesterday. That's an hour and a half of my life I'll never get back. <laughs> Okay, that was, a, that was a joke, you got it right, okay. <laughs> I actually, I stained Connie. I got lipstick on Connie. <laughs> I felt really bad, because I got lipstick on her head. I did offer the, the Tide pen, because I always have a Tide pen in my bag, because I'm such a klutz. Um, I did offer the Tide pen, but she didn't. I don't know if she's mad at me still for getting lipstick on her head. Anyway. Um, I'm here to answer your questions, so um, I think there's a microphone somewhere in there, so why don't y'all, uh, y'all, I mean the South, listen to me. <laughs> Not only am I a citizen, I'm obviously from the South. Um, yes, I became a citizen, I'm an American citizen, I'm dual, I am dual, yes. Oh, wait a minute, is it July 4th today? <laughs> this is the day I feel schizophrenic. Because the English part of me is like, God damn it. <laughs> and the American part of me is, yay! <laughs> so I'm a little confused on July 4th, but I have to say one thing. When you threw the English out, you kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater, I have to say. When it comes to elections, I just want to say one thing. In England, it's the law. You can only campaign for 30 days before an election. <laughs> Awesome. Wouldn't that be amazing if it was hit? Because they start campaigning as soon as they're elected, right? And each, each candidate in the last election spent a billion dollars. I'm sorry. There are way better things to spend that money on than TV ads. You know. You know, when there, are kids go when there are kids going to bed hungry or, and they don't have a roof over their head, I actually think it's immoral to spend that kind of money on an election. <laughs> so, don't get me started on politics, because I'm in Minnesota, <laughs> and I've got a feeling you're a red state. <laughs> oh, you're not! Yeah! You know why I thought you were red state? Because Kevin Sorbo is from here. <laughs> and he's crimson, he's so red. Only if you're rich. Only if you're rich, okay. Oh, true, yeah, right, okay. Oh, see, I did it backwards. When I was poor, when, I'm not rich now, I'm comfortable now. But when I was poor, I was right of Attila the Hun, really. 
now I have a few dollars in the bank, I've gone all lefty. It's like, it's called, it's, 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 I think it's an English thing. It's money guilt. <laughs> when you grow up in Europe, you're kind of frowned upon if you have too much money. You know, it's like, you know, that's just not fair. It's just not fair. So um, as soon as I started earning money, I started giving it away, which was kind of stupid. But anyway, because um, now I have to work my ass off. Okay. Anyway, questions. Let's get back to the Star Trek. Go and stand in front of the mic. You have to stand in front of the mic so the whole audience can hear you. There you go. Yeah, thank Hello. you. Uh, it's not a Star Trek question, but it is actually a science fiction one. Okay. What, when you started in uh, Stargate SG-1, what was uh, Richard Dean Anderson like? Okay, now, when you've been on Star Trek The Next Generation, which was basically the flagship show for everything sci-fi, let's be honest, yeah. right? You know, we, we, when we came along, when TNG came along, sci-fi was alternative entertainment, right? It was alternative. Cut to 27 years later, sci-fi is the number one form of box office, right? That's what makes the most money at the box office. And why? Because of TNG. Because of TNG. I'm, you know, this isn't anything that I've read anywhere. This is my opinion. And I think I'm right. <laughs> because um, I'm a Greek English woman, and we're always right. <laughs> so um, when I went over to do, to do Stargate, um, because obviously, like I said, TNG was like the flagship show, um, I got treated like I was the Queen of England. <laughs> I think people were curtsying even. It was very <laughs> bizarre. But I rem um, at the time, Richard Dean had a two-year-old. His little girl was two. And it was in his contract that he would leave the set at six o'clock, at least to have some time with his kid, which is fantastic. Um, because a lot of people in Hollywood have children, and they hand them off to a Mexican chick to raise, right? And um, nothing wrong with Mexican chicks. I'm just saying that's what happens in Hollywood. Um, so to me, that child is an accessory not actually a proper child. So if you're not gonna raise your own children, why are you having them? That's my opinion. <clears throat> you know, I understand if you're poor and you have to work, but actors in Hollywood, if they're working, are not poor, okay? So I don't get it. But anyway, so he was going off with my full blessing to go and be with his daughter. And we were shooting the scene where I arrive in the Jeep to the, to the airplane. And we shot his side, and um, it was like five to six, and we shot his dialogue, and I saw that his driver was waiting, and I said, Richard, I just saw your driver's here. And he went, no, Marina, I'm not going. And I went, oh, but your driver's here. And he went, oh, no, when we get actresses, oh, sorry, actors, PC, when we get actors of your caliber, I stay to do my off-camera dialogue. Then what happened? I got so flummoxed. <laughs> I kept screwing up the lines. I was, then he made, me, he made me nervous by saying that. So, um, but that was, you know, it was fantastic. Now, my other story about SG-1, the people who saw it, at one point, we had to jump out of the airplane. And because SG-1 is Air Force, and, you know, it's, it's not set like, hundreds of years in the future, they actually had real Air Force guys there as advisors. <laughs> so, wait a minute, you won't be woohooing at the end of this story. <laughs> so, he comes up to me and he goes, you know, you're wearing a real, like, Russian parachute, because uh, I had the real ugly Russian helmet. Amanda Tapping had the cute, shiny American helmet. <laughs> I had the Russian helmet. You look at it, it looks like it was made of duct tape. It had like, duct tape all over it. And she said, that's a real parachute that you're wearing. You know, we do everything, everything is authentic on this show. So we're practicing jumping out of the aeroplane onto a pad, you know, onto a mattress pad. So I'm jumping, we have to do this God knows how many times. And I kept doing it wrong. And they're saying, watch Richard Dean. He does it right. He kind of flew through the air, you know, and like landed on the pad. And I was just dropping like a, <laughs> like a bag of potatoes on the mattress. 
So anyway, we finally got the shot. The next day, I can't move. <laughs> My back is killing me. And I went, hang on a minute. It might be the, uh, you know, an authentic Russian effing parachute that I'm wearing, but no one knows. Because the parachute is in the parachute bag. <laughs> you could have filled it up with newspaper, it would have been 50 pounds lighter, and I wouldn't have a bad back today. <laughs> so I'm not one for being authentic, really. Because <laughs> what the eye doesn't see, etc. right? So, yeah, as far as the Air Force guys were, dumb as a bag of hair, the lot of them, honestly. <laughs> it's a real parachute, idiot. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> as you can see, as you can see, Marina is much more like Demona than she is like Deanna. <laughs> right, okay, right. In fact, I have to tell you, the hardest thing about playing Deanna Troy for seven years and four movies was, was keeping Marina out of her. <laughs> there had to be no Marina in Deanna. None. Unless she was drunk. or she lost her powers. <laughs> like in that episode, the last where I lost my powers, my husband said to me, how come when Troy loses her powers, she becomes Marina? <laughs> well, when he'd regained consciousness, I explained it to him. <laughs> yes, dear. See. <clears throat> Uh, next gen, you were very famous because your cast was essentially like a family. Yes. And everybody else says, oh, we're going to be just like next gen. We're going to be one big family. And you can't just say, oh, we're all going to play like team players. You weren't just team players. You were something else. Was there something that caused that to come I, about? You know what? I wish I knew. I wish I knew because from the first day when we were all together, which we weren't even shooting, we were doing our makeup and hair tests. You know, they get you in a week before and they start faffing with your hair and your makeup to figure out how you're going to look, right? And I remember sitting in the makeup trailer and Jonathan came in like a whirl, like a tornado. And I, is, I mean, because I don't know if any of you have met Jonathan, he is a force of nature. He is like literally a force of nature. And I, and I went, this is going to be an awesome job. This is going to be fantastic if this is what it's gonna be like. And then on the first day of filming, we were laughing so hard, I was convinced we were all gonna get fired. <laughs> we had a director in the first season who directed two shows and then refused to ever come back. <laughs> because we were too rowdy. <laughs> and that was in the first season. He should have come back in the seventh. <laughs> really, I mean, we were, so, we were really told off. Rick Berman, our executive producer, called us into Tasha's quarters. I remember, this is how early it was, because Denise was still on the show. So we get, we, got, we get ordered into Tasha's quarters to get reamed by the producer that this is unheard of in the history of Hollywood, that a director would refuse to work with actors, and we should be ashamed of ourselves, and blah, blah, blah. So Denise, bless her heart, she goes, well, you know, sometimes we're here for 15, 16, 18 hours a day. If we're not having fun, it's going to be horrible. It's going to be murder. And Patrick, because when Patrick first came on the show, he was a bit up his own bum, I have to say. <laughs> He was a bit up his own bum. So he said, and where, Denise, does it say in our contract that we're here to have fun? <laughs> Cut to season seven. He's the silliest one of all of us now. <laughs> As you all know, if you follow him on Twitter, <laughs> right? It's a very silly old man now. He is old. Just because he married a child doesn't make him any younger. I've got shoes older than her. No, she's an awesome girl. She really is. She's just young. Um, anyway. What were we talking about? Family, right, the family. Yeah, so basically we hit it off and I'm pretty sure it wasn't intended. I did, I'm pretty sure that when they were casting us, Gene Roddenberry didn't say, oh, I think they'll get on really well together. 
That's not an issue in Hollywood. They don't care. There is one show that no names, no names. There are two protagonists and they loathe each other. In fact, one of them said to the other one, unless we're acting together, don't speak to me. I can't imagine working like that. I really can't. We were, we were never in our own trailers. We were always visiting. Always, we were always in somebody's trailer all together. Um, we would go to parties and at the end of the evening, we're sitting in a corner on our own with our backs to the rest of the room. Um, we, we just, it just worked. It just worked. Um, I'm not saying that the other cast didn't get along. There were groups who did get along within those casts, but to have all seven get on fantastically well was pretty unique in the Star Trek world. And you know, and people say to me, are you guys ever gonna write a book? No, because there's not a publisher on the planet who wants a book where you say, we all loved each other. <laughs> they want dirt, and there was no dirt. Probably because there was no hanky-panky, which we can't be said of the other shows. Hanky Panky will put a spanner in the works faster than anything. Do you know what a spanner is? Okay. Wrench, a wrench, right, okay. English lessons free, okay, yes. <laughs> Next Gen is known for having lots of morals in each of the episodes. I'm curious, between uh, your own, the experience of the teamwork and the camaraderie, what lesson do you think you personally learned and took away as being the greatest moral that you ever personally be, were influenced by? And did it come from an episode or did it come from the experiences with your castmates? I tell you what I learned. Um, you'll be surprised to hear this, but I threw the occasional tantrum. <laughs> we call it a wobbly in England. So I threw wobblies. And that vernacular was taken up by the whole cast and now the whole cast says, Wobbly, it's wonderful. Um, so I would throw wobblies. Um, what I learned, however, was if you're mad at something, and this is what I learned just through working with a lot of people for a long time, because obviously the relationships get deeper and more intense, as opposed to going off and doing a month somewhere or a week somewhere, you know, seven years together. Um, what I learned was you can be mad at someone, but you don't have to humiliate them in public. And that was what I learned, because I used to yell at people, you know, in public, and that's not right. It really isn't right. So I learned that about myself, that that was a really mean thing to do and a really mean thing to be, and I changed that. In fact, when people, <laughs> when my friends, you know, who've known me, obviously my cast members who've known me all these years, when I go off and do something else, and they'll say, Marina, what, and I'm like, I am as good as gold now. And they're like, what? I'm like, yes, if I do have an issue with someone, I take them to the side and I talk to them, you know, like a person. Um, so that's what I learned. I learned that just because I'm one of the actors in the show and so, you know, on the totem pole of importance, say, in the studio's eyes, I'm higher than the craft service guy. But to be honest, it wouldn't work if everybody didn't do their job. From the craft service guy, to the cameraman, to the actors, to the costumers, to the hairdressers, everyone has to do their job and everyone's job is just as important as mine. It's just that I end up on the screen at the end of the day. That's the only difference. So that's what I learned, to be nicer. Yes. Um, one of the most important costume changes that happened on Next Generation was the transition from the uh, quote-unquote boob uniform to the <laughs> official uh, science uniform. Which costume did you prefer and also how did you feel that it infected or impacted female empowerment in the show? This is the costume story. Make <laughs> yourselves comfortable. It's a long one. <laughs> so. When I got cast on Star Trek, the reason why I wasn't wearing the spacesuit, same as everybody else, was because I was fat. Not fat in normal terms, fat in Hollywood terms, right? Where they're all matchsticks with the wood scraped off. <laughs> right? Um, 
basically, when I gain weight, I gain it all in my middle. So if you imagine like a potato with matchsticks sticking out of it, that's me, <laughs> right? So I got the job and literally the phone call went, you got the job, lose five pounds. That was it, literally. And then I got the call halfway through the first season, do you want the good news or the bad news? I don't care. Okay, good news is your work yesterday was fabulous. Bad news is you look fat. We pay you a lot of money to look good. Think about it. Hung up the phone. Guaranteed to send you to the nearest tray of donuts. Right? <laughs> that kind of conversation, girls, isn't it? Yes. So, anyway, so they went, okay, well, she doesn't look, you know, she doesn't look good in the uniform, so what do we get? Let's put her in the cosmic cheerleader outfit. Let's see how that works. <laughs> and I do have good legs. I do. Look, they're good. The legs are good, right? So, <laughs> so they figured that if, if the legs were on show in the go-go boots, that no one would be looking at the rest of me. And I do have to point out, that hair in Encounter at Farpoint, that exploded Brillo pad on my head, <laughs> that is my real hair. Yes, it is horrible. The only time my hair was in fashion was in the 80s. <laughs> and I was, I was like the business in the 80s. <laughs> but anyway, um, so they put me in the cosmic cheerleader outfit and then they realized it didn't really suit the character to be in the micro mini with the go-go boots. So Jean decided that being as I was a counselor, um, I, I would put people at their ease when they came to see me if I wasn't in uniform. So let's find her something else to wear. So they took me to a color specialist. Have you ever been to one of these? Talk about hours of your life you'll never get back, right? <laughs> Sitting there for two, three hours on my day off on a Saturday with this woman holding swatches up to my face, right? For three hours. And what do we end up with? The ugly grey space suit. <laughs> we end up with grey denim, is what we end up with. And not denim like it is today. You've got to go, it's 27 years ago. It's real denim, no stretchy fabric in it. So it was like wearing a pair of skin-tight jeans up to my neck, right? And then they put a belt in one of the other colors that was one of my colors, the pink or the green, right? Exactly where my fat was. <laughs> I would used to watch the show and think, well, why don't they just have arrows pointing to it? This is where she's fat. <laughs> then they decide, and then of course I became the only girl on the show. And I had, because originally I wasn't supposed to be the chick. That was Denise. She was the chick, she had the ass. I have no ass. <laughs> In fact, Jean, I think probably Denise and, and the two black guys have the only asses on TNG. <laughs> the rest of us send search parties out for our asses. <laughs> so anyway, um, so I had to be, I, had, I was supposed to be, wait for it, the brains of the enterprise. <laughs> I know, step back in amazement, I know. Um, <laughs> So anyway, I put the grey space suit on and then I started to lose, and then I had to really be serious about getting skinny because I was the chick on the show. So, you know, I did, I got thinner and thinner and then they made me the red suit and then they made me the purple suit. And I, I don't know if you realize there was a real shift because there are certain rules in Hollywood, unwritten rules, but one of the rules is, you know, if you're doing an action show, action adventure, you've got to have chicks on the show. And if the chicks have a cleavage, they cannot have a brain. It's not an equation in Hollywood. Brains equals cleavage. Doesn't work, it's the opposite of an equation. So if you think about it, no names, Pam Anderson. You know, it's like... <laughs> The two don't go together, right? She's a very nice girl, by the way. Anyway, um, so when I got a cleavage, all my grey matter went south, disappeared, absolutely. I just became decorative, like a potted palm on the bridge. <laughs> there I was, you know. So and then, we get, and then we get to the green dress, which I hated. I have to be honest, I hated. It was basically a leotard, all in one, with a skirt sewn on the top that I had to get naked to go to the bathroom, right? I be, and because we have invisible zippers in the 24th century, um, 
I had to be unzipped from it, so every time I went to the loo, everyone knew I, where I was going, and my fellow thespians would be like, is it a number one or a number two, Marina? <laughs> like, shut up. <laughs> and I had to wear a corset under this, under this dress, not because I needed to be skinnier, but because the fabric was so fine, and as you all know, we are wrinkle-free in the 24th century, <laughs> which is why all the boys do the Picard maneuver. <laughs> right? So anyway, then we get to season six, and along comes Captain Jellico, who we all know, they're trying him out, just in case Patrick wants too much money the following season. <laughs> right? So Captain Jellico says, well, you, why aren't you in a spacesuit? Go put one on. And so, they gave me a spacesuit. They didn't even make me one. They gave me one that belonged to one of the extras, right? <laughs> oh, sorry, we're not allowed to call them extras anymore. To one of the atmosphere. <laughs> um, <laughs> so PC, honestly. So anyway, so I had this spacesuit on, and by then I was very thin, and so they were like, oh my God, she looks great in that. Why hasn't she been wearing that for years and saved us thousands of dollars in costumes, you know? <laughs> So then I wore my space suit, and wouldn't you know, the grey matter comes flooding back. <laughs> In fact, there was an episode, I'm going to say timescape, but don't take my word on it, because I'm not good on the titles of the shows. Um, but I was suddenly the expert in Romulan technology. Do you remember that? Because I went on the, I was disguised as a Romulan. I went on the Romulan ship with the lovely Carolyn Seymour. And, you know, suddenly I'm the expert in Romulan technology. And I have this line and I say, that's impossible. The Romulans use an artificial quantum singularity as their power source. <laughs> and who did I say it to? Data and Geordie. <laughs> like they don't know this. <laughs> I mean, honestly, when I was shooting the scene, I'm like sneaking looks to either side to make sure they hadn't developed a cleavage while I wasn't looking. <laughs> yeah, that, exactly, it's Star Trek. You know, you can die, you, ca you never doesn't matter. You come back, you know. Look, we just punish you when you die. Like Denise, we kept bringing her back with worse wigs every time she came back. <laughs> Bad wigs. Yes, dear. Um, it's a huge honor to meet you. I just want to know with uh, the next generation, um, what was your, who, who did you prefer to work with and why? All of them. Oh. All for different reasons. Okay, so Patrick, because you're working with the master, right? And I remember one time, um, so there were a lot of times when, you know, if you're heavy in the episode, you, it's a decision you have to make. Shall I sleep or shall I learn my lines? And this particular time, I decided to sleep because it was the first scene up in the morning and usually we would go in, rehearse the scene, and then we'd go away and they would light it and I would have, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes and I figured I can learn two pages of dialogue in 45 minutes, easy, so I'll learn it tomorrow morning. Well, they had pre-lit the, the ready room. So as soon as I was done with makeup, they're like, okay, Marina, we're ready to shoot. And I'm like, what? What about the rehearsal? What about the lighting? Oh, we did that last night. What? So now, if it had been any other person on the show, I wouldn't have cared, right? But I'm working with Patrick. And I, have to, I can't not know my lines. I just can't. So I'm literally walking to the set trying to, literally like this and and somehow they went in somehow they went in and through panic actually I think more than anything it was like I can't not know my lines and they went in so Patrick I enjoyed for that I mean not for put me under pressure but just because you know um, Brent I loved working with because I loved data and I just loved all the choices that he made and he always brought out this kind of maternal thing in me, um, which I thought was really special. Um, Jonathan I love working with because we, we just have a really special connection, I think. Dorney's my best friend. Working with him sometimes was weird, especially when we had to be married. 
in that alternate universe, right? And I had to kiss him. It's weird kissing your best friend. It is. I made him take his teeth out. I'm like, I don't, you know, really. How, I, know, I mean, we know that Klingons are stupid. I mean, we know. But even stupid Klingons would have discovered dental floss by the 24th century. <laughs> Don't you think? There's really no excuse for those teeth anymore. I mean, what is he, English? I don't know. Um, <laughs> except I have good teeth. And like, no braces, nothing. Um, anyway, so, and who else is left? Gates I used to like working with because she's nuts. <laughs> Gates is crazy. Gates, Gates is the queen of props. She always had to have props. She wanted to be doing stuff with her hands. And so we'd, it would always be like, let's give Gates some props and see what she does with them. So it was always really fun and exciting to work with Gates. Um, and then LeVar. LeVar is... <sighs> LeVar, I always used to say, because he's very kind of spiritual and, you know, like new agey and all that. And I'm kind of the opposite of that. So it was a good... I liked working with him because I felt it was a good balance between us. And also, I used to just... What, look at him in amazement with all the techno babble he had to say. Yeah. And he said it so fast. And I was like, how does he learn that stuff? I really don't know, and say it that fast. So just awe with, with LeVar. But actually, all of them, uh, to be honest, our favorite times together, as, and I think every one of the cast would agree, is when we were all together, like on the bridge or in observation, they were our favorite days because that was when we had the most fun, when we were all together. Um, I mean, I remember there were two times, two specific occasions where I laughed so hard. You know when they say you're rolling around on the floor laughing? Yeah. I was literally rolling around on the floor laughing. <laughs> My legs would not support me anymore. <laughs> Fond memories. At least I didn't pee myself. <laughs> yes, dear. Would you have liked being more Romulan more than just no. an episode? No! Excuse me, I'm Romulan. <laughs> you had power in the episode. I've renamed Romulus. It's the bad hair, bad clothes planet, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. What is it with the Romulans? Do Romulan hairdressers only learn one hairstyle in beauty school? And what is it with the shoulder pads? Really? Linda Evans had a garage sale? I don't know. <laughs> and the galoshes inside, where it's dry. <laughs> no. And plus, I hate wearing prosthetic makeup. I've actually turned work down since because I, I won't wear it anymore. I hate it. It's, I, I don't know how Michael Dorn did it for seven years. Actually, he did it for 11 years, right? Because he was on deep sleep as well. So... Um, <laughs> Well, it's better than what Jonathan calls it. He calls it deep throat. So, you know, anyway. <laughs> so, anyway. So, um, what were I talking about? What was I talking about? Romulans. What? Romulans. Oh, pro oh, hate prosthetics. Hate it. I always used to feel that, because I was always getting in trouble at Paramount. They had a party when I left, honestly. <laughs> but, oh, thank God she's gone. Um that uh, I think they used to punish me by making me wear prosthetics occasionally. We'll get her back, we'll put her in prosthetics. We'll make her 150 years old, see how she likes that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yes, dear? Uh, do you want to do any impressions of the cast that you worked with on... Oh, Next honey, I, you know what? I would love to, but I, I don't do impressions. I'll do... Try to. Wait, wait, okay, I can do... I can do Riker, I can do Riker. I wish, I wish I could do impressions. When you meet, um, uh, when you meet Brent Spiner, ask him, because he does a brilliant Patrick. Um, but Trust if you ask him to do Gregory actors. Peck, it sounds exactly the same. But anyway. <laughs> I don't, I wish I could do impressions, honey, I really do. I really do. Anything else? Nope. Hello, um, was wondering, uh, with if you could put the income part aside, 
which type of uh, median do you uh, prefer working in, whether it's the voice or the television? Theater. Okay. Theater, yeah. Thank you. I was trained as a classically, I was a classically trained theater actress. That was what I, that was my training. At my drama school, we didn't do anything more modern than Radigan, which I think was the 1920s, you know. Um, so I had a real classical training. I went straight from drama school into the theater, um, where I stayed, really, for most of my career until I came to America. So uh, it is my first love. I love doing something all the way through, in the right order. <laughs> Yeah, um, I love the, I see, I love, this is why I love doing conventions, is because, um, because I grew up in the theater, I miss audience, you know. This is my live audience fix, coming to conventions. It really is, I get as much out of it, if not more than you do, trust me. Um, I go home, my husband calls it my soap dish moments. <laughs> if you all saw the movie Soap Dish, do you ever, okay, I'll explain it to you for people who didn't. Um, soap Dish is about a, a soap star, um, Sally Field, and she's getting a bit, she's getting older, and you know, there's a you girl, and there's all that insecurity going on, and so Whoopi Goldberg takes her to the mall, and kind of stands her in the mall, and then goes, oh my God, is that, oh my God, it's her, it's her, it's her, like she doesn't know her, and then suddenly there's a huge crowd of people around Sally Field, and she's signing autographs, and being the star, that's a soap dish moment, right? Where you need, actors are very strange people. Let me just tell you this. We don't care about the people who love us the most, like our friends and family. We care about the total strangers sitting out in the audience. We want you to love us. And that is, I remember talking to a therapist because I was playing a therapist. I figured I should maybe go and see a therapist. <laughs> because in England, we don't really do therapy. We have a cup of tea and a cigarette and we get on with it. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> pretty much. And so I thought, well, if I'm playing a psychologist, I'd never been to a psychologist, I'd never met a psychologist, I should maybe go see a psychologist and see how you do this thing. So I went to see a psychologist and I said to her at one point, it's interesting that all my friends, all my fellow actors on the show, we all have the same kind of issues from our childhood and stuff like that. And she went, Yes, and that's why you all became actors. And I went, oh, right. <laughs> so, um, see, what happens with the menopause is this. <laughs> you forget what you're talking about halfway through a sentence. You can never go off topic because you never remember what the topic was in the first place. For you young girls, you'll remember this conversation when you hit the menopause and you're standing in the middle of the room going, why did I come in here? Why did I come in here? All the old chicks know. All the old chicks know. And people say to me, Marina, why do you talk about the menopause at Star Trek conventions? And the reason I talk about it, and I always talk about it, because it always comes up, because I always forget what I'm talking about, um, is because we're never taught about it in school, women. I don't know about in your schools, we would talk about, we're taught menstruation, we're taught fertility, we're taught about having babies. They even show us the film. I'm sorry, they started showing the film of someone giving birth. I'm like, do you know what? Why am I watching this? Women give birth, they're at the other end, they can't see. <laughs> Why do I have to watch this? Because if it really happens, I'll be at the other end. Which is why I'm amazed that women make their husbands watch it. They can't see it. Make him watch it. Make him videotape it. I don't understand. <laughs> anyway, back to the menopause. So we're taught about all that stuff. We're never taught about the menopause. It's this dirty secret. So when you get it, and if you get it early like I did, you think you've got out early onset Alzheimer's. Because you can't remember a damn thing. Honestly, it's like, get pasta. What pasta? You know, the long stringy pasta. Oh, you mean spaghetti? Yes, that's the one. Yes, spaghetti. <laughs> True conversation, honestly, really. So, um, we better ask another question. It's all gone. <laughs> it's erased, wiped. Yes, dear. So, some of my favorite Deanna episodes are where your mom uh, came on. Who those was going as... through the menopause when we were shooting those episodes? <laughs> Yes. 
which explains a lot. <laughs> and were they as fun as they seemed? Yes. Short answer, longer answer. Um, you know, we shot Haven, which was the first episode that Majel appeared in. We shot Haven as the third episode, although it wasn't shown as the third episode. So, as I've said, we were rowdy. But the boss's wife is going to be on the show. So I think each of us kind of went, you know what, we better behave ourselves just for one episode. We'll be good, we'll be professional, you know, all that stuff, be quiet. And then she came on the set, and within 10 minutes we realised she was wackier than the rest of us put together. <laughs> and she fit right in. <laughs> and she was fantastic. And as much as I, I wasn't a fan of Deep Sleep until Dorney went on it, um, I am loyal to my friends. Uh, I do have to say, the one thing I appreciated about that show was that it gave Majel a chance to evolve her character. Because she wasn't just the crazy Auntie Mame. You know, she, there was much more to her, and there was much more to Majel as an actress than that character. And so I was thrilled that she was given a chance in DS9 to really show all her colors and what a great actress she really was. So I was always really. She was great. I, in fact, when my, my own mom passed away before she did, and um, I remember saying to her at a convention, you know, you have to last longer because you're the only mom. You're the only mom I've got left, but now she's gone too. So anyway, at my age, you know, it's like when Patrick says he gets on well with his, do his, his daughter, his um, wife's... Uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> He gets on well with his wife's parents. I'm like, Patrick, at your age, your girlfriend shouldn't still have parents. <laughs> um, but anyway, yes, dear. Can you talk about what it was like to work on Family Guy? Oh, you know what? No. Because, um... <laughs> because we did, you know, Gargoyles was fantastic because we did it like a radio play. We were all in the room together. We had fun. It was like acting is reacting to me. Acting is listening to what the other person's saying and reacting to it appropriately, right? Um, for me, going into a sound booth and putting headphones on and reading a script and having someone in my headphones say the lines doesn't really do it for me, I have to be honest. I totally admire voice actors. They are crazily talented. I remember when we were doing Gargoyles, um, there'd be one line you know, one line, one character had one line. And the director, Jamie, would say, okay, I need old Scottish guy, talks like a dog. And three hands would go up. <laughs> and you're like, really? That's in your repertoire. <laughs> really, old Scottish guy, talks like a dog. And, but it is, they can do so much with their voices that they just, they just do it. I don't do voices. I have a voice. I do accents. So... And if I didn't do accents, I'd be unemployed forever. Because when you look like this, you better be able to do accents. Because, <laughs> you know, I don't look like an English rose, you know. And um, I look ethnic in America. So, you know, better, better do the accents. But so I was always really, really fascinated with the voice people. But to me, sitting family guy, I was in the studio on my own. And it's not rewarding to me, although it's a very funny episode and it was on again recently, I understand. I've never seen it, never seen it. I don't really watch myself that much because I'm watching sports. <laughs> For the man who likes sports, I am the perfect woman, which is not my husband, by the way. Um, <laughs> but for the man who does like sports, I'm the perfect woman because I watch sports all day. I'm a great cook. And I've got big boobs. So, <laughs> perfect woman. Yeah, I'm not watching myself because I'm watching football, the real football, where they kick the ball <laughs> with their feet, as opposed to the throw the ball football that you play. But I also watch the throw the ball football when it, I do, I love it. Um, and then I watch, um, well, also watch tennis. So, I, can you imagine the last two weeks? I've been like, oh my God, what am I going? There's tennis and football at the same time. Thank God for TiVo. Okay, so 
But then, you know, I never leave my house because I'm watching the football live because that's my number one sport. So I'm watching the football live and I'm TiVo in the tennis. And then I'm like, okay, but I have to stay away from all the news media because I can't know who won the tennis because I want to watch it and not know who won, right? My husband's like, is there any way you could earn money watching sports? Because that's what you do more than anything else. And I'm like, that's true. It is what I do more than anything else. Yes, dear. All right, so some people here know that a lot of the Star Trek cast went into a cartoon show of some sort. Was that, <laughs> so was that a deliberate attempt by a Star Trek fan, or was that just a deliriously happy coincidence that you all ended up there? Where? I think it was called Gargoyles or something like that. It was called Gargoyles? Yes, I Oh, think that so. show? Yeah. Oh, okay. You were being a little kind of... The Indirect. word's gone. What? It was a little ob obtuse, and I wasn't getting it. Oh, uh, actually, we had to audition. Well, they didn't just offer us the job. Um, we had to audition, and um, I did two auditions, I think. Greg Wiseman and I have d different memories about this. <laughs> now, I'm right. <laughs> We've established this earlier. I'm right. What happened was, I went in to read for Alyssa, and I read it, and they said to me, you know what, we think you're actually more right for another part, but we don't have the copy with us today, so would you come back tomorrow? And I went, sure, and I went back tomorrow, and I read Demona, and you know, the rest is history kind of thing. Apparently, um, they knew, I was the first person to read for Demona, and they knew that the job was mine, but they had booked auditions with like 30 other actresses, you know, which they had to audition. You can't call actresses up and say, you know, by the way, you're not coming. Um, so you have to go through the motions even though you really know who's got the job. I mean, I didn't know I'd got the job. I had to wait, but they kind of knew, which I took as a compliment because it is a bit of a, you were so evil, we knew no one else could match up to it. <laughs> But I took it as a compliment, just in case. Yes. yes. Uh, how often do you and the cast get together now? A lot. Apart from Patrick, because he doesn't live in Los Angeles. Um, but the rest of us, we're, we're, you know, as much as you see your family, the ones that get along with their families, we, you know, we see each other. And, it's, and now we've started doing these reunion conventions, which are the best. We don't care about you lot. We just have so much fun. <laughs> because we don't bring our significant others. <laughs> we party like it's 1999, really. <laughs> we have to go back that far because we're so old. Um, but no, we part, I mean, we get, we just enjoy each other so much that when someone says, oh, like Patrick brought Sonny, his wife, to um, Austin last year. And we were like, really? You're bringing the girl? <laughs> None of us bring anybody, you know. You know, it's like, you have to be, we have to behave ourselves now because she's not really like one of the group yet. Because although they're in the group, the husbands and the wives and the girlfriends and the boyfriends, they're not really the group, you know. As I was saying, they're not the group. And so we kind of resent <coughs> bringing the outsiders in. Very cliquey, very cliquey. It is very strange, yes. I first want to say that you're a wonderful and amazing actor, so I'm going to insult Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to insult you with a silly question. Okay. Would you do a sitcom of the Rikers? Oh, for sure. That was my idea. What do you mean, would I do a sitcom of the Rikers? <laughs> it was my idea. Listen. That freaks. That fr they're always stealing my material. They really are. I, I make all the jokes. They come and listen. They steal my stuff. Honestly. No, that was my idea. The Rikers in Space, half-hour sitcom. <laughs> and we'd get our friends, they'd have their wacky Uncle Data and their little dog Worf, and... Um, <laughs> it would be awesome. It would be awesome. Listen, we've been told by Paramount and CBS, which is basically what's happened now with, with Star Trek, is Paramount does the pictures the movies, and CBS will do TV stuff eventually. Um, I, uh, what was I saying? Who's paying attention? Oh, the Rikers, yes. We've, we've been told, thank you for paying attention. We've been told that um, 
they're really not interested in anything Star Trek that is doesn't in you know that isn't part of JJ's vision at the moment. Although he's not going to direct the next movie, is he? Because he's doing Star Wars. Oh, do you know what? It's like you fans are going to be like all Sybil. You, you, you know, remember Sybil, the schizophrenic lady in the movie? That's who you're going to be. You're all going to be Sybil. It's Star Trek, Star Wars, Star Trek, Star Wars. You're going to be like crazy with it now. We have one person involved with both. It's going to do your heads in. I know it. Yes. Hi. Um, was there any episode of The Next Generation that you thought was especially ridiculous? Especially like the premise was just totally there were ridiculous two. to you? There were two. There were two. Both in the first season. Code of Honor. <laughs> Can we talk about Code of Honor? I was ashamed. I was literally ashamed of the black guys in the tribal costumes and the white blonde girl and the white blonde girl having to fight the black girl and all that and you know I just thought it was so racist it actually I still get like feel sick when I think about it and then the other one was Angel One just shut up <laughs> You've, got, you've made my point for me now because there's this planet where these women have been running the show for donkey's years, right? Okay, the men are dressed like ballerinas, but that's all right. <laughs> There's these women on this planet, they've run the show forever, and then this hunky Riker comes down. <laughs> he makes one speech, and they start considering changing their form of government. <laughs> really? Really? So that pisses me, that doesn't make me feel sick, that pisses me off as a woman, right? You're just like, and I, have to, and I have to remind you fans that, I'm not looking for snot, I'm looking to see if I had lipstick on my fingers. Um, that's too much information really for you, wasn't it? Okay. Um, what was I saying? Angel one. I was pissed off, I was really pissed off, yeah, because it's just, yeah, because, this is what I was gonna say, Although we were a show set in the 24th century, you do have to bear in mind it was written generally by 20th century men. Mm -hmm. All right, so bear that in mind when you're watching the show. They weren't as like, you know, they were writing good stories, but up here, they were raised by women in the 50s. That's all I have to say, okay. <laughs> right, yes. Oh, I already asked. Oh, you, you already said the asked. one that I hoped you would say, so that's cool. Oh, really? Yeah. Was that Angel One? Angel One, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think we can pretty much ignore the whole first season. Yeah. I think so. I think, I think we were all finding our feet, you know, we were trying to all getting used to what the show, finding the characters, you know. Um, excuse me? Getting the makeup right, yes. You know, Dorney always says that he took, um, oh, I'm done. Dorney always says that he was always the first one in the makeup trailer by hours, and that actually isn't true. It's amazing to me how they, I know I have no memory, but I have memory of like long time ago, I know the words to every Beatles song, right? That hasn't gone, that's still in there, right? It's what I had for breakfast yesterday that I can't remember, um, or this morning. Yeah, gone. Um, <laughs> but, uh, makeup trailer. Okay, right. I'm like, what is this sign language? Okay, all right. Was I in the middle of something, though, before you interrupted me, Nikki? All right. Oh, yeah, he would say, oh, I was in the makeup trailer for hours before anyone came in. Uh-uh. I was 15 minutes after him. He was 5.15, I was 5.30. It took two hours to get that face perfect. Listen, you've got to let the spackle dry first, right? <laughs> Sand it off. Now, honestly, I, I, I look at pictures of myself then, and I have to say, girls, all you young girls out there, appreciate your beauty now. You're beautiful. You're young and you're beautiful. And I look at pictures of myself then, and I'm like, why didn't I know I was pretty? How come I didn't know that? Didn't I have eyes in my head? Didn't I have mirrors in my house? You know, and it's really interesting that... It's society, basically, um, telling us that we're not perfect. We're perfect. 
Um, we're perfect. We are. We are all perfect in our own way. And, you know, I grew up, I grew up in the 60s where Twiggy was it, right? You know, everyone I grew up with had an eating disorder, everybody, because we all tried to be like that, right? Um, but what I realize now in my, in my, and I'm 60 next birthday, I'd have no problem saying it. I wish it hadn't taken me this long to figure out what I just said to you, that we are all perfect in our own way, especially the women. It's like, you're beautiful. Everyone has beauty about, everyone has something beautiful about them, everybody. And don't, it, realize it. I think that's what I'm trying to say, is realize it. Don't wait 40 years like I did and go, why didn't I know I was so pretty? You know, because then it's too late. Um, if you realize how beautiful you are now, oh, bless your heart, bless your heart. I wasn't, I wasn't, no, no, I wasn't fishing for, um, but anyway, I just want to, I, I really feel strongly about this, that, you know, media, especially now, girls, every picture you see is fake. Every single picture you see of a famous person or a model is fake. It's photoshopped. Nobody looks like that, right? So bear that in mind and just be proud of who you are now because you're perfect now and you will always be perfect just the way you are. So I'm not going to finish just yet. I just want to say before I go, after I've just given you a big lecture, you will be, listen to me. <laughs> um, I just want to say, because uh, I'm not going to get a chance in the Gargoyles panel to say this. Um, a lot of people in showbiz, and I know a lot of them, um, they s tend to forget, they seem to forget that you could be the greatest actor, the greatest musician, the greatest painter, the greatest whatever in the world, but if you're not recognized by the audience, you may as well be acting in your garage, right? We owe everyone in show business on my side of the camera owes everything to the audience. It was you guys who turned your TV sets on for seven years and kept us going. It was you guys that paid money to go see our movies that kept us going. Obviously, you didn't spend enough money on Nemesis, that's why we were canceled. That's all I'm saying, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> but it was you, it was you, and it's because of you that I have every blessing in my life. I have, well, I used to say thank you for my car because I had an 85 Porsche Carrera which got stolen about, got stolen about two months ago. I know, I had that car for 22 years. I had just had it restored. <laughs> I know, I know. But anyway, you bought me that car, thank you. <laughs> you, bought me, you bought me my house, you bought me the clothes I'm wearing. You even got me my husband, because he's American, and I would never have met him if I hadn't been in, a, in, in this country making Star Trek. So basically, every blessing in, I have in my life, I owe to you, and I want to thank you. And if you ever see me not being appreciative of you, I give you full permission to smack me around the head, okay? <laughs> Because you are the reason I'm here, and God bless you all. God bless you.